Friends, would you pray with me? The holy God of the squirrel and the blue whale, take our lips and speak with them, take our minds and think with them, take our hands and work with them, and take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and all of creation. Amen, Bao. So the 4th of July just happened, and our nine-year-old son got to ride his bicycle in a parade, and it made his parents quite proud. Right before him in this parade was a float. You all know what a float is, right? It's, it's a vehicle that has messages, and on that float there were signs that I had to think twice about and translate. It was a float full of Swifties. Catherine, you're laughing. I think you know what that means. These were people who are fans of none other than Taylor Swift. Now, I'm told by some of my connections, my, my nieces and nephews, that Taylor Swift is popular, is a singer, songwriter, and, and, and people know about this person, and they, and they follow her as Swifties. Um, and, and apparently, she's written one or two love songs. Now, one of my nieces says she's actually a little bit more known for her breakup songs, but we're going to forget that for the sermon today. She's known for her love songs. So this morning, y'all, we have, we have Jesus and Taylor Swift. We have, we have Matthew and the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Psalms, and we have a gospel reading and a love song. Thank you, Sierra, for so well lifting these scriptures before us today. So today we also encounter some of the most pastorally iconic and loving words in all of scripture, and some words that many of us have probably memorized. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. A deeply sacred and useful mantra for all of those for whom sleep is hard to find, for all for whom rest is so desperately needed and yet sometimes so hard to find. I, I think we would be done here if, if we went home after today and wrote that scripture on a card and just put it in a sacred place where we are where we live, where we work, where, where we gather. That may be more than enough. But today I am struck with the context of the words leading up to this refrain. You hear some words from Jesus, and then it's almost as if it's a different person that lifts these other words about coming to me and finding rest. For it seems as if this Jesus is not full of rest, but is more restless in this story. Remember the wider context. In the chapters that lead up to this 11th chapter of Matthew, we know of Jesus going out into the countryside, gathering disciples and teaching and healing and changing things, countering empire all along the way. But the beginning of chapter 11, this verse says, Now when Jesus had had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. Jesus is amping things up here. He's he's increasing the confrontation, but also increasing the platform to bring his message to a wider world. And you hear again and again in references throughout Matthew of the crowds that gather. Right off the bat, I want you to hear, when you hear crowds, I want you to think of positive reception. Those who gather, the crowds most frequently receive Jesus in a positive light. And these are faithful Jewish folk. Far too often, some of our scriptures have been used in the work of anti-Semitism, in the sin of anti-Semitism, and lifting up this false narrative that Jesus was rejected by his fellow Jews. He is not. Over and over again here, his message is well received. But there is a small contingent, but a loud one, sometimes linked with the Pharisees, that question and try to topple and counter his message, and that's what we're getting at here today. In this context, Jesus' relative, close friend, and forerunner, John the Baptist, is now unjustly incarcerated and on death row. We can only imagine the emotion that may be washing over Jesus as he finds time to contemplate that reality. Can you imagine the one who 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 announced the way, who prepared the way for him in the wilderness, suddenly is being snuffed out, it seems, by the powers that they came to speak against. 
I wonder if Jesus questioned his own motivations and what might soon perhaps happen to him if he keeps on this way of pronouncing love over fear. So Jesus, we can imagine here, was a bit depleted, a bit restless, the walls perhaps feeling like they're closing in on him. I think we can all relate to that. Walls closing in on us when bad things happen in our lives, when we lose loved ones, when a job ends precipitously, when a relationship, Taylor Swift speaks about, sometimes breaks too early, or when the clouds, the literal clouds, envelop us, when our beloved Canada remains on fire, burning through those climate-changing clouds that come to us and make it hard for us to breathe. I had one of those 2 a.m. wake-ups about a week ago when, when those clouds came back in to this part of the world, and I, I just couldn't sleep after that. Two in the morning, I started worrying about not only our current reality, but my son's future, right? What might it be like for him? Did Nadia Boats, did, did, does Nadia Boltzweber have that prophetic word that says maybe the best of times have already come and gone? Well, what does that mean for us in this climate changing world? We had the 4th of July, the hottest day on earth ever, at least in the past 125,000 years. So scientists believe 122 degrees in North Africa on the 4th of July. And that's not the only thing that feels like the walls are closing in on us. On the 4th of July, we had historic gun violence across our country, 16 mass shootings across, 16, uh, across 14 states in which 15 people were killed and nearly 100 injured. And probably the most shocking is that that line and that news does not shock us anymore. As Presbyterian minister in Washington, Reverend Liz Kearney writes also, a feeling of being closed in. After a windfall of supremely unjust Supreme Court decisions this past week that are bent on attacking the personhood of our black, indigenous, and people of color siblings and threatening the very, existing, the very existence of our queer beloveds, it can feel impossible to hang on to our gritty dreams of liberation for all of creation. It just feels like we're, we're surrounded by forces that are bad. Jesus must have felt that way at the beginning of this Matthew text, but I also wonder if he not only felt depleted and restless, but angry. We can see that in today's text, and I think sometimes when we fast forward to verse 18, come to me all who are weary, we forget the first verses that lead up to that. Jesus is not happy here. He is laying out a lot of woes to these cities that he has just been in, woes to cities and places that have seen his power at work, and yet have failed to repent, have, re have failed to change, to turn around. This is what gets him upset. And of course, those few that misunderstand him also misunderstood John. They thought that he, John was just this throwback prophet who was demon-possessed and out there. And then, of course, when, when Jesus came and, 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 and hung out with people and had meals with them, they called him a drunkard. He hung out with sinners and tax collectors, a glutton. So both John and Jesus here are so quickly dismissed by those in power of powerful message is of hope and of God's relationship with humanity. But those relationships, that relationship is clouded by these people in power who are misunderstanding the messengers of peace and love. And so Jesus lashes out. He's had enough. He's angry. And we get it. We often hear of Jesus' anger later in Matthew, the flipping of the, the table. But I would invite you to read again throughout this gospel. You will see many references to woes and hypocrites and condemnation coming out of the mouth of the one of peace. Jesus' anger is targeted on those who refuse to believe in change. We get that anger as well. As we've seen, the powers that be, who have known about climate change since 1959 at ExxonMobil, 1959, they've known about the human-caused effects of climate change and have intentionally not only done nothing, but have done all they can to counter good change. We know about that, and we get angry, the fact that there are guns still in our communities and that LGBTQ folk are under attack by 
cowards in our legislators across our country. Friends, we get angry. And I think this text is telling us that is okay. Not only is it okay, it's perhaps maybe the way to be in the midst of our hot summer, in the midst of our sleepless nights. This may be a way forward. Because into this, into this anger, into this feeling depleted, we hear these words given to us, come, come, come. This is throughout this text here at the end of Matthew in the plural, come to me all of you who are weary, and then I will give you all rest. And I think that plurality is important. Come to me those of you who are grieving losses of people who have died too soon, of dreams that are not able to be lived out because of the powers that be. They are reassuring words. They are deeply reassuring, but they are also motivating, right? They don't end with just come to me and rest, but come take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Continue in the way, Jesus is saying. Keep on with the learning, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, your bodies and your souls, I would add. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We've heard this many times. What is that yoke of Jesus? What is that yoke? We know about it from the agricultural roots of the day. It's that, it's that, it's that brace that is put on animals right, that we then connect to to help both the animal and us to plow the field or to, to pull the wagon. Commonly, it is, it is more than one tying together two oxen to make lighter the work. It is about movement here, but for Jesus, the yoke, the analogy, is what Jesus is all about. His message over and over again that change is possible, that healing is something you all deserve, and that love is what I am here to tell you. It's all about, indeed, a love song. So I'm a little more familiar with the late, great Tina Turner than I am with Taylor Swift, so I think we can just ask that question, what's love got to do with it? It's an ironic question as she asks it. She doesn't want a place of it, but she knows she needs it. We all need that love, and that's where this incredible love song from one of the chart-topping greatest books in our scripture, the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Song, Song of Songs comes. The voice of my beloved, look, they come leaping on the mountains, bounding over the hills. This book, y'all, is a great summer read. It is, it is relationships, it is sensual, it is sensing, it is thirsting. And it has a central role. It's almost in the middle of the Bible. I know like Psalm, what, 118, 117 might be the center of your Bibles, but Song of Solomon is not far off. The, the middle of the, bottom, the book, if we take the Old and the New Testaments together. This mutuality that is represented in the Song of Songs in our scripture le- read today holds a central place in our faith story. And I believe Jesus knew these verses as he went out into this world. It's also a very earthy love. We lifted this text at our spring equinox, equinox even song service right out here on the Charles River. Now that the winter has passed, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time for singing has come. Today's service is full of song, you may have noticed. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts out its figs. The vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, I, I'm, I'm a, maybe a little bit more of a fan of Nora Jones, who in 2002 put out that song, that, that subtle romantic ballad, Come Away With Me. Come away with me, we hear Jesus inviting. In the midst of all this turmoil, Jesus, Jesus pivots and says, I am so angry, I am so burnt out. I feel like these powers are beyond us. John is about to die in jail. But come away with me. We have power still. We have a story still to tell. And there is work to do. I love the image of a, of a double yoke with two oxen together. And I believe Jesus here is, is, in effect, putting on one side of that yoke and saying, come on, y'all, find your own. Together, we will make the road. Together, we will make it easier to move forward and to live out that love. 
Our former pastor here at Church of the Covenant, Reverend Jennifer Wechner McNelly, died too soon. We know that and we lament that. Even as we continue to give thanks for her legacy of faith in the Christian tradition and in this part of our story here at Covenant, her last sermon among you all before I was here was entitled, My Yoke is Easy. And she pointed out to all of us the sparrow window that Charlene so regularly points out to us, the sparrow window at the back of the sanctuary, which you're going to look at on your way out today, which depicts Jesus looking down at a sparrow. But if some of us may not have noticed, Jesus is carrying a yoke. He's carrying a single yoke, maybe a double one behind him. It's a yoke. And he's looking down at that sparrow, the forgotten thing of creation, something that seems common but is so overlooked in Jesus' day and in ours, that speaks about God's image in all of creation. And I love that we have this image connecting us to the earth, reminding us that we are human beings and not human doings, and ultimately, if we remember the root word of human as hummus, we are earth beings. Our rest and our mission is intricately tied into the earth. I think we all get that in summer, where it's probably hotter inside the sanctuary than it is outside. We find solace and we find direction and missional calling in creation. I love Eugene Peterson's translation of this text from the message, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, Jesus says. Come away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest, walk with me, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lie. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. What? translation. The yoke of Jesus is indeed light. It is easy. It is kind. The Greek is a better translation here. It is kind. It is gracious. It counters the unsettledness and the meanness all around us, but it also doesn't leave us in the same place. I am so grateful of the mission and ministry of this church that Jennifer sang out too as she left and moved on into the world, continuing to bring light and love in the years that she had from this place forward. I am grateful that the ministry of this church has not stopped for now 180 something years and it will continue in God's grace. But it requires all of us, just like the open covenant project that we are trying to lift up today as we bring this banner outside will only succeed if we are a part of it. We are the face of this community and we have a story to tell. We have a witness. We'll have a training on how to do that this coming Tuesday at six o'clock on Zoom. Whether you can join us for this open sanctuary project, open covenant project or not, we all need to be trained and reminded how to tell the good news story, how to be witnesses to God, witnesses that always are prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have but do so with gentleness, humility, and respect. This is our calling as people of faith. I love this community is engaging in this project, and I see an easiness to that and a yoked nature of that. I have seen that week after week in the work of our deacons at this church. This past week, a success was lifted as one of our own found new housing and it took a village, and it will continue to take a village to nurture one another, looking and facing the realities of housing injustice here in Boston. I love that our community here, and I see examples of this movement being made lighter as we move forward through the questions that we bring to our sacred scripture. You remember last week when we were given a, a real difficult one from Genesis? We had Sarah and Hagar lifted, and, and some of you, I remember Ed saying in that reflection on the word, I am, I am troubled by this text. I do not like this text. I remember Nancy lifting up, how amazing is it that the, that the story of Hagar is even lifted in our Hebrew scriptures? What a gift. They could have easily left that part out. And Lucy lifted over the internet this past week a different reading of that through the lens of those who have been marginalized, specifically African American women and the story of shadow slavery in our land, and reading Hagar through that lens, a more womanist perspective, 
I think, frees us. In thinking about that text, I, I was reminded that Hagar is the only person that I know of in our Holy Scriptures who names God, El Roy, the God who sees me. So this person who is dismissed by both Sarah and Abraham is seen by God and has a special relationship with God despite all of the other things that are happening to her by an unjust world. I love that our community wrestles with our text. I love that we don't just keep those questions to ourselves but continue to debate in Bible study and worship and in conversations. What is God and what is the Spirit inviting us into in this world, in this time, and in this place? So fellow earth beings, it's okay to get mad. It's not only okay, I think it's called for when we see these path forth of Julys with so much injustice around us. But remember, the yoke of Christ is made easy if we don't keep that anger to ourselves. If we live out that anger nonviolently in community, I think things may begin to shift. There's a wonderful quote lifted uh, by Cole Arthur Riley of Black Liturgies. She lifted it on Juneteenth recently, which uh, gave me some solace and some direction. She quotes John Edgar Wideman by saying, do not fall asleep in your enemy's dream. Do not fall asleep in your enemy's dream. Be careful who you let regulate your hope. Liberation is after you. And all dreaming is dangerous to those who benefit from our numbness. Friends, let us not be numb or give in to the ways of, of, of anger that seeks to destroy. Let us give in to anger that helps us build up, that helps push back against all those who are feeling hemmed in, push back against the forces that are causing those to feel hemmed in. I also am instructed by Jesus' line here that he very well may be quoting Moses when he says, Come to me and I will give you rest. Moses, you remember, right at the beginning of that wilderness journey, in the shadow of slavery, in the shadow of empire, Moses heard the words of God as he left Pharaoh behind. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Rest? is liberation. Rest is change. Rest is hope. So friends, let us remember the plurality of this work. I will give you all rest because our life flows on. Our life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. We hear that sweet though far off hymn that hails a new creation. Let us never Never stop singing. Let us seek rest together and know the change God needs for us and for our world. Amen.